Yacht A, my relatives. Good morning. It is about 11 o'clock on Friday morning, and today is uh, Friday, March 11th. I'm sitting down with my second cup of coffee, and I am very excited because today I'm going to be having a conversation with Renee Begay. Renee Begay is a Zuni woman uh, living in New Mexico, and she has been working for decades with Native students all throughout the country. I've had the privilege of meeting Renee when she was a student at Rehoboth uh, Christian School in near Gallup, New Mexico, and have seen her and her husband's journey for the past uh, several decades as they've worked with Native students and have really uh, done some incredible stuff. In fact, we've had a chance to um, co-found and co-lead the Would Jesus Eat Fry Bread Conference together. And so I'm very excited about this conversation we'll have with Renee in just a few moments. But uh, before I begin, as I always do, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from what's now known as Washington, D.C. And these are the traditional lands of the Piscataway. I want to honor the Piscataway as the host people of these lands. I want to thank them for their stewardship of these lands. And I want to just state how humbled I am to be living on these lands today. So... Uh, uh, yeah, my Piscataway relatives. So let me go ahead and bring Renee on. Here she is. And uh, Renee, yeah, hey, it's so good to have you. Thank you for joining me for a cup of coffee this morning. Good morning. <laughs> in fact, this cup that I, I, I use in my uh, every morning was actually a gift from you and your husband. Uh, I don't know where you found it, but the the bluebird flower mug that the two of you yeah uh, it's well one, loved <laughs> it's one of my favorite mugs so <laughs> thank you thank you for sending it yeah um, so we it, found it at the flea market <laughs> in Gallup <laughs> in Albuquerque or back in back in, near the red in Gallup New Mexico oh you did yeah yeah so many people ask me where where they can buy one of these mugs and I'm like I don't know where so <laughs> I guess I'll have to send them to the flea market yeah, yeah. I don't know who the artist was or the vendor name, but we were walking around Gallup Flea Market and we were okay. like, this <laughs> is perfect for Mark Charles. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me today. Is there any way you would like to introduce yourself? Um, yeah, I can I can introduce myself. Um, um, so I just uh, introduced myself, Renee Begay, um, Kyla Stiwa, maiden name. I'm from the Pueblo of Zuni, and my clans are Sandhill Crane clan, and I'm a child of the Eagle clan. Well, thank you. It's an honor to, to have you, and thank you for sharing with us your family and uh, uh, who you are as a Zuni woman. So, a uh, yeah. mm -hmm. You're living in Albuquerque, New Mexico now. Yeah, yeah. My husband Donnie and I and our uh, three daughters we live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Yeah, so we live here. And I understand your kids go to a pretty unique school there as well. Not quite an immersion school, but it's a it's a native school in Albuquerque. Yeah, correct? yeah. I I enjoy it. I've been having a really good experience with um, NACA. It's Native American Community Academy. It's a charter school. Um, and I think it's part of a network. It's called NACA Inspired Network. They have um, some pretty cool stuff as far as like their, the, the methods that they use with school. Um, yeah, some of the things that really uh, I've enjoyed is um, instead of calling it parent-teacher conferences, they call it student-led conferences. Um, so they provide the opportunity for students to talk to their parents about how they're doing in class and then they start off the time with a wellness wheel so they have like a circle with like the slices of the pie where each um, each quadrant is uh, talks about their emotional wellness their academic wellness all these things to like kind of um, address the whole and yeah. our um, our daughters will tell us like how they're doing emotionally socially academically and then they shared their goals with us. So it's really neat. Like, yeah, I've had a really good experience with them. That is really good to hear. I One of the things we missed a lot when we moved from the Navajo Nation to Washington, D.C., is our 
children were attending a Navajo immersion school, um, you know, and to go from an environment where you're surrounded by native students, your teachers are native and you're learning your culture and your language. And then to come to uh, the school systems here where there's no native students at all. Mm -hmm. and so it's been a, a challenge of how do we continue to help our kids to understand, you know, their history and where they're from and so on. So yeah, I'm, I'm jealous <laughs> yeah. of the that, that you are the, of the school that your kids are going to. Um, so one of the things that you and I were talking about yesterday as we were preparing for this, and one of the, the larger uh, conversations we've had on my YouTube channel and social media for the past few months was this uh, second cup of coffee I did about a month ago where I talked about decolonizing our understanding of creator. And I began talking about as I've gone through my own journey of decolonizing my faith and understanding what does it mean to be Native, be Navajo, and be a Christian, I was always raised and told to see God in the in the a triune God, right? You have Father, mm -hmm. Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But as I've gone through my journey of decolonizing, I have actually found four characters, unique characters of God that I need to relate to differently. Um, the first is creator, who mm -hmm. I meet and understand not only through the book of Genesis, but even through my own people and my own faith journey. And then we have the God of Abraham, right? The God that reveals himself to Abraham, makes a covenant with, Israel, with the Jewish people. And that, that, those stories take up the bulk of the scriptures. And then you obviously have Jesus, which mm -hmm. occupy four of the books, the Gospels. And then you have the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God which is more, much more prevalent in the final books. And so I've begun to see, and, and I think that this, so the difference is, is I'm making a distinction between creator and the God of Abraham. Mm -hmm. And I've actually found it very helpful because right, the God of Abraham, my story is about that characteristic of God is about his covenant with the Jewish people, which I can glean from, I can learn from, but that's not a covenant I share in. And so I, I come read that as an outsider. Whereas creator, right? I know creator, my people know creator. Mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a person, I've known creator. And so I'm looking, I'm looking even as a, as a Christian, what does it mean you know, one of the conferences that you and I started was uh, together. We helped co-found you and your husband, Donnie, and some people from IV as well. This Would Jesus Eat Fry Bread conference. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I've always wrestled with is, yeah, would Jesus eat fry bread? And for a long time, I said no. And recently, I realized, well, actually, he probably wouldn't have because he was a Jewish man. And but in reflecting on this, I'm like, I'm asking the wrong question. Rather than asking, would Jesus eat fry bread? I should rather be asking the question of what does it mean that the blood of Jesus reconciles me back to creator? Mm -hmm. And what does it mean that I now have a reconciled relationship with creator? So I'd love to get your thoughts on not, not my journey, but your own journey of understanding and growing up knowing creator as a Zuni girl, as a Zuni woman, and then becoming a Christian, and then part of that faith you were offered was very colonized, and then decolonizing mm -hmm. that faith. And I'd love to hear some of your thoughts and even what has your journey with Creator mm -hmm. been like over the course of, of your life up to this point? Yeah. Um, bef I think before I answer your question, I was just kind of thinking as you were talking about how we co-founded that um, Would Jesus Eat Fry Bread conference um, that uh, it's one of, I don't know, is it the only conference or one of the very few conferences that has a question at the end of it? <laughs> and that's, I, th I think that's the beautiful part of it because it is a place where we hope that people would come with their questions and be able to wrestle with those questions um, because we know that certain generations have had the question of, can I be native and Christian? And then once that question has been um, engaged, now different generations are asking a different question, which is, 
um, in some forms or varieties, uh, yes, I, I can be Native and Christian, but how do I do it? And so I think I've been kind of in that combination for a while. And my journey with Creator has been very personal. Um, I, I mean, growing up um, in the Pueblo of Zuni, um, I was proud of who I, mean, I am. I'm proud of who I am uh, growing up in the Zuni, Zuni traditional life ways and um, was so um, confident in my uh, upbringing and identity. Um, but there was always a question for me um, that I would ask a lot uh, of, you know, where were our prayers being directed to? And granted, I was very young asking that question. And in, in those types of spaces, you know, to be a child and asking hard questions, uh, it kind of catches the adults off guard. Um, and so <laughs> I would, you know, um, some, sometimes my questions would be uh, maybe not uh, put together in the correct way or whatever. It was probably more blunt or whatever. But the, the question that I had always had growing up was like, where are my prayers going? And where are my prayers being directed to? And there was always this um, desire of transformation um, that I was very aware of at a young age. And so um, even as I was growing up in the traditional life ways, um, I would constantly ask myself this question um, and then engage anybody who would, you know, even try to or listen to, to my questions and try to answer them. Um, and when I was in high school, my mom sent me to uh, Rehoboth Christian School um, because she had heard that it was a really good academic school. And so, you know, she valued my education as a single mother. And so she sent me there. And um, before that, I was going to a Catholic school from kindergarten to eighth grade. And so the, even that transition of going from Catholic experience Catholic school going to mass genuflecting making the sign of the cross all those things and then transitioning to a Christian high school where I was told you know there's chapel services there it's not like a, um, a Catholic service but here are the things that you need to know because my cousins were going to school there and I remember my family um, the first thing they would tell me was uh, the first message that they I distinctly remember was like be respectful um, when when they pray during the chapel service you pray um, and I'm really glad that my family gave me that message of respect um, to that even though I wouldn't fully understand what the Christian um, rituals were going into that school um, that that I would remain respectful to what was being done there um, and then even coming back home uh, because at the time when I from freshman year to senior year I I stayed there at the boarding school um, and then the boarding school closed I think the the portion closed when when I graduated um, so I, I stayed there at the at the school um, and so even that like experiencing the kind of like the homesickness um, going back home for every Friday evenings and then riding the bus on Mondays back to school like that was just kind of my experience but even through all of that just being told to remain respectful um, to pray when when they prayed um, I think that kind of like softened my heart to be open to the questions that I had about where my prayers were being directed to. And then even meeting with um, the high school counselor, uh, he would share Bible stories with me about, you know, who Jesus was. And then I began getting more interested, like who, who is Jesus? Um, how does he relate to me? Um, what, what can, you know, what, what can I learn from him? And then hearing all these stories about who Jesus was, was just like, that began, I think, for me, the, the desire to really get to know him. Um, but then there was a deep wrestling within me for like a whole year of whether or not to follow him. Because even though they advertise or like say that it's an individual decision, it's not. For me growing up, I knew that 
deciding to follow Jesus was not going to be an individual decision. It was going to be a collective decision and it was going to be a decision that affected my family. And so knowing that I, I had to really think through what was going to happen if I did make that decision. Um, and um, I think once deciding to follow Jesus, um, there's a lot that's happened, but like even just um, supernaturally um, feeling, you know, the Spirit's presence in the room when I did accept Jesus and then um, journeying on to like going to college and then eventually um, joining a predominantly white uh, Christian evangelical organization. Uh, there's been a lot of like wrestling of what my identity looks like um, yeah. as a Zuni woman following Jesus. So, yeah, knowing you, I, I, I know some of your stories, which I'm, I think will come out in a few minutes, but mm -hmm. you, you have done some really good work of maintaining your own identity as a Zuni woman, even mm -hmm. in the midst of a very white male patriarchal, you know, institution uh, that you work with and that you interact with all around the country. And I'm very impressed with the way that you have learned to, um, advocate for yourself and your people and to even to present things of, hey, there's something we need to think about or do differently here. Mm -hmm. um, before we get to that, uh, one of the questions I wanted to talk about and the question we had yesterday, right, is that we, you and I were discussing as we were preparing for this was um, I've, I've been on my own journey over the past two years of recognizing that Jesus would not have eaten fry bread, right? His model of inclusivity was much more slanted towards Jewish people than towards Gentiles. And as a Gentile man, I would have, like, the interactions I see of him in Scripture were different the way he treated Gentiles as compared to the way he treated uh, Jewish people. And, again, I need to understand that I come into this as, a, as a, someone who's not Jewish. And wrestling with, okay, so then where do I get included? And then looking closely at Acts 10, I preach sermons on this. I've done a lot of this discussion here on, on my thing. And you've heard some of these things. You've watched mm -hmm. some of these videos. You mm -hmm. and I have had discussions about this. And you were sharing with me yesterday about how you, in light of, as I've been wrestling through some of these things publicly, how you kind of frame that in your own mind around Jesus being a man of ceremony. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to have you expand on that for a moment, if you could. Yeah. Um, well, what I've appreciated, I think, in even just sharing your vulnerability about your wrestling for the past, I think, like over a year and a half. Um, you know, I I didn't say anything publicly to what you were wrestling through because, like, I appreciate that it's a, a spiritual um, wrestling that you're doing with Creator, and so even as I would listen to a lot of like your talks and what you were wrestling through, um, I respected it because we, as indigenous people, we need to be given spaces where we can, um, what Cheryl Bear, Dr. Cheryl Bear coins as um, self-theologize because indigenous people haven't been given that chance to self-theologize. We've always been told what to believe. We've always been told how to look, how to talk, how not to talk, uh, you know, all these things. And so it's, it, um, she talks about, Dr. Cheryl Bear talks about like how native peoples need to be given the, the chance to self-theologize. And, and I've, I've always like, I've taken that and just, you know, even listening to you and, you know, you're, you're an awesome mentor to Donnie and I. And even as you would call us and just kind of verbalize what you were going through, you know, I would wrestle with it too. Like, oh, these are these are things that I didn't see before, but you know, um, it's not gonna help if I have this like, no, that's not true. Um, I would just, you know, take it in and just think through it and think about it and pray for all of us and stuff. And, and then um, just recently I was watching your, um, you talk about it again with a good medicine way 
And as you were talking about how the how Jesus would was um, interacting with the Seraphonician woman and the centurion, um, and then you brought into in this uh, cultural insight that like with the centurion, um, if he invited Jesus into his household, there would have had to be this whole cleansing that would have happened because you know he's a Gentile and like if you know all these like this uh, this cultural insight that you brought. And then it kind of clicked for me where I was just like, huh, um, if I if I think of Jesus, you know, as a, a man of ceremony or a man that's in ceremony, it makes sense to me with my upbringing because I grew up in a traditional way where there were men in our households who were uh, taking on like a religious commitment. And during these commitments, there's a certain space and season where perhaps there wouldn't be as great affection as we could show each other, but it wasn't to be mean. It was because they were setting aside this time where they were fully concentrating on the commitment that they had made, whether it would be prayers or things that they were um, giving themselves to, to learn. And so therefore, once all of that energy was going into it, the next word that I thought of was boundaries you know, like a man of ceremony or a woman of ceremony understands their boundaries and the boundaries of the people that they're serving um, or that they're in ceremony for. And so when I think indigenously that way, it makes sense for me because here's a man of ceremony who you see in the scripture where he's always talking about, he's always pointing to creator. He's always saying like, I'm not here for myself. I'm here for creator. Um, all the things that I'm saying and doing are because of what creator told me to say. And so in that sense, if I think of him as a man of ceremony, I understand the boundaries that he's in. He understands the boundaries that he's in. He understands the boundaries that he's in as far as interacting with, you know, perhaps Jewish versus like Gentile people. And in the sense where, you know, you talked about, you know, at first you were offended that, you know, perhaps Jesus wouldn't interact with you. Um, I was, I was even thinking back, you know, as a child where I was like, I, I would get my feelings hurt if like one of my family members wasn't able to give me a hug or whatever, but it was because they were in ceremony and mm -hmm. I had to, I didn't understand it at the time, but once it was being explained to me, it was like, Oh, okay. This is what it means to have, you know, understand the boundaries for which you are put in. And so if we think about it that way, then Jesus knew who he was. And and then we also yesterday talked about something about like how Jesus knows who we are and he respects our boundaries when you were talking about the man that got healed on the mat. And when he asked if he could follow Jesus, Jesus said, no, go back and tell your people about what happened. And yeah. I, we said something about like how how Jesus respected his identity to not try to bring him into all these like cultural baggage that he had or try to like put on something that wasn't meant for him. And yeah. I think, yeah, our conversation yesterday, I wish it was recorded, but like we're talking about <laughs> it now. But like that was just a new thought that I had. But I was just like, if if I can think of Jesus as a man of ceremony, then I understand the boundaries within which he was conducting himself. And he did it in a really good way. Yeah. And so therefore, if he if he completed the task that he was doing, the ceremony that he did and he completed it then there's room for the spirit to like expand more on like what it means for us to be in our identity, to live to who we, he made us, creator made us to be. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah I, I wish we could have recorded the conversation we had yesterday too. <laughs> As we were prepping for this, we had this really in-depth dialogue about, <laughs> about what we were going to discuss. But yeah. one of the points we were making, which, which you brought up was I was saying how by allowing myself to acknowledge according to the scriptures jesus would not have eaten fry bread right because as you said he was a man of ceremony the ceremony he was here to complete was a sacrifice of his mm -hmm. own body to reconcile mm -hmm. all of creation back to creator and mm -hmm. that sacrifice that ceremony required not that he keep the moral code of 2022 perfectly but that he keep the jewish law perfectly Mm -hmm. And the Jewish law required a separation between Jews and Gentile. 
And so once I was able to get past being offended of Jesus wouldn't let me follow him, and I was able to, as you so eloquently put it, through your Zuni worldview, he was in ceremony and therefore there were boundaries that had to be there. What I realized is the interaction Jesus did have with Gentiles, right? Because back then, to have relationship with God for a Gentile mm -hmm. in the Jewish worldview, you had to become Jewish, right? You had to, men had to get circumcised, you had to learn Hebrew, you had to study the Old Testament, you had to become Jewish. And so if, if again, as Christians, we believe that Jesus was God in human form, so God in human form, when he spoke to a Gentile from a different faith tradition, a different cultural context, mm -hmm. and this Gentile, the demoniac in Mark, in the book of Mark is begging Jesus to let him follow him. And Jesus, again, had he said yes, the guy would have had to become Jewish. And Jesus instead is like, no, don't do that. Just go back to your own people and tell them about what the Lord did for you, which was this healing he just did. Mm -hmm. And therefore the guy didn't have to learn the Jewish culture, understand the Hebrew language. He could just go back and, and in his own story, in his own way, completely contextualize what he experienced and share that good news with people around him. And I thought, what? an amazing invitation, right, to contextualize, to self-theologize, to not take on the burden of any of this other cultural baggage, and to truly just go off and, and talk about your experience with Creator. And so again, the, the question that it's really driving me much deeper towards is rather than asking, would Jesus eat fry bread, which is a nice question, but I think misses the point. The question I'm more focused on now is what does it mean that through the blood of Jesus, I am reconciled to creator? And what does that mean? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. And and yeah, so anyway, I, I, I love your insight to what does it mean to be a man of ceremony or a woman mm -hmm. of ceremony mm -hmm. and recognizing that that's this point Jesus was in. One of the things, you know, I, I also want to go back and kind of pick up on was you talked about when you were deciding about your faith in your own journey, you realized this wasn't an individual decision, but it was a corporate decision that would have impact and implications on you and your entire family. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think as indigenous people, we bring not just into our faith context, but into our social context and our work context and everything else, because Western culture is so hyper individualistic, yeah. right? And it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very linear in its way of thinking and it's very schedule based and it's very much kind of task driven and, and you know, uh, getting accomplished accomplishments done. Mm -hmm. And native culture is very different, a, a more circular perception of time, not focused near as much on the schedule and just checking off a box. Yeah. And I would love to hear, I know there's some great stories you have about how you have brought some of that understanding of ceremony and not just going by the schedule when other things need to be done first, as well as bringing in more of a corporate mindset instead of just an individualistic mindset into, and especially as you have kind of climbed the ranks of your, your position and your dialogue <laughs> within nations and within crew, um, you've had some ability to influence meetings and influence the structure a little bit. And there was a conference you were telling me about just a few months ago that you went to where you actually said to your organization, hey, we have to do something different because of what we'd experienced. I'd love if you could talk about that for a moment. Yeah. Um, well, you know, all all of us had the experience of like the lockdown during pandemic and like we're just, you know, coming out of you know, that, that rhythm and then being entered into back to in-person meetings. And so this was one of the meetings um, with crew leaders that, that I was invited to, um, to attend. And there was a lot of, um, you know, uh, just going back and forth about it even because, um, you know, we, my thinking was I'm, I visit, 
you know, back home probably every maybe three weeks. And so the timeline between that with the risk of getting COVID and all those things, like it's, it's um, still high and it's still risky. And then, so sharing this with other, other BIPOC leaders, they also come from collective communities where they have to be really careful. And so even before the meetings happened, the BIPOC leaders, we had to meet with the, the designers of this conference saying, we need to have required testing, which, you know, they weren't comfortable with requiring, but we had we kept going back and forth of like, we come from collective communities, we need to have required testing before we arrive. And so um, thankfully, you know, they, um, they, the, the leaders said, okay, we'll have required testing. And so even before the meeting, we, there's this like moment of like having to try to change um, certain rhythms and certain thinking. But once we got to this meeting, it was like, you know, happy to see you. Like we, we're going to get started. Like here's the to-do list of the things that we're going to talk about that we have to talk about before the end of this um, conference. And it was like these four main things that, that needed to be talked about. And I was like in this like whiplash state of like, whoa, <laughs> we've actually, we've been in the, in the cave for like two years, you know, like we haven't, we've interacted virtually, but like, um, like one of my elders said, it's, it's so much different experiencing pixelated pictures versus like being in person. And so, I felt that I felt the that whiplash moment of like we're trying to keep continue to keep going the way we've been going, which is fast, linear, moving forward. You know, all this all this stuff, the words that you were using. I felt that, and so when when there was a pause, I I I, t I spoke up and I said, I'm I'm struggling with going forward so quickly because we have to acknowledge that we have not seen each other in two years. And there's many stories in the room where there's stories of loss, there's stories of people catching COVID probably, there's stories of staff leaving, um, there's stories of like things that have probably happened in the family, all, this, all these things like we need to acknowledge and talk about the pain first before we actually begin to talk about what we're gonna do next. Um, and with that, you know, that that's just one of the things that like I have had to kind of step into. And a lot of times like it, it's um, for me, it's like a physical reaction that happens and I can't be quiet about it. And so I have to say something. But then there's a lot of times where I have to really weigh like, do I say something now or how do I say it? thinking relationally like do I go to the person first or you know all these things but that's probably two examples and another example was when I was in a leadership uh, training where um, it was the same thing welcome we're going to get to work on these things like we're going to give you a project and I was like whoa we haven't even done introductions <laughs> and that's really important with the indigenous world is like introductions like who are you who are your people? Where do you come from? Where do you live? Like, who are you related to? All those things. Like, I mean, yeah, one one meeting that we had with you and some other elders, we spent the whole day just sharing with each other, like who we were, yeah. what's been going on, all those things. And so when I shared with this leadership group, I, I can't even get into work until I know who you guys are. Like we need to do introductions. And so the next day, they pivoted and they set up the room. They changed the room setup. They set it up in tables of circles and like they had people introduce themselves and like talk to each other and get to know each other before the thing. So I don't know. So those are just some of the examples yeah. of like how I have to, I don't know. Yeah. I, that's what to do. As you were sharing this, I felt like, you know, one of the things, the roles that we play as indigenous native peoples, people who come from communal backgrounds instead of hyper individualistic backgrounds is, it feels like there's a, a way, and I don't mean to say this in a demeaning way towards the majority culture, but we almost have to remind the people in the room that we're human and not machines, mm -hmm. right? We can't just 
be like on a factory output line, just producing, producing, producing. We have mm -hmm. to come in and acknowledge each other's humanity, mm -hmm. whether it's producing ourselves, whether it's the pain and the challenges we've been through, or even the joys and the triumphs we've experienced. We have to come in and be human mm -hmm. before we can start talking about, okay, what are we producing? What are we working on? What is our okay. agenda here? And I think so frequently the, the majority culture, Western culture, forgets to remind itself that it's human, right? And forgets to remind itself that, that we have, we're human, we have human needs, we have the need for relational and emotional and communal connection. And when we go too long and too far without making those connections, it actually damages us and our organizations. And mm -hmm. I love I, I love hearing these stories of ways you've been able to do this, even <laughs> at a much higher level within your organization. One of the last things I want to talk about here for a moment, and there's so much we could go off on in talking about these mm -hmm. things. This was a decade ago, I think, and you were you were you and Don, you were doing nations, you had got out gotten out of college and you were working with crew and we were you were starting to work with students at Las Cruces. And you were invited to speak to a national conference for mm -hmm. Campus Crusade. I think mm -hmm. they were still Campus Crusade back then. They weren't crew yet. And it was a large group. And it was kind of your first major public speech, I think. And you, yeah. you and I had a conversation <laughs> about how were you going to address this? What were you going to say? How were you going to um, really be yourself in the midst of that? Mm -hmm. And how could you be different from just every other speaker who was going to be on stage mm -hmm. in both what you said as well as in how you presented it? And we, we talked about a poem that you wrote when you were in college about your own identity mm -hmm. and talked about how that could be very valuable to share that. And, to you know, so I'd love if you could just talk a little bit about that. Um, it, it's a poem that you titled I am from, but this is like, if, if, if people are following the Rene Begay uh, platform, <laughs> right? This is one of the, one of the things that really kind of put you out there and made a lot more people aware of who you are and the incredible insight that you have into what we need to be doing both as a church, as well as as a nation. So I'd love to share, have you share a little bit about your story of I am from and yeah. Yeah. Um, we just, I, I remember meeting with you um, in, I think it was Window Rock. We met Window Rock, Arizona, when you were still living on the res with your family. And um, we were talking about, uh, okay, here's the message that I'm going to share. Um, but the, the design team of that conference asked me to close off the time with a prayer or something like they gave, kind of gave me free freedom to do whatever I needed to do and it was and it's the usual theme is usually like close off with prayer or pose a question a discussion question and then you know like you're done but I remember telling you that I didn't want to do that I wanted to do something that would kind of um, engage what I had just talked about um, in a practical way that would help people start begin to think of themselves as a like a relational being versus being someone that produces you know said things about ministry you know like this is these are the things that I produce or this is my role or this is who I am um, instead I was just kind of talking to you about how you know what what kind of activity can we do to help people to begin to think of themselves in a relational way um, and so I showed you my um, I am from poem, which is which I didn't create. It's it. Uh, my professor gave me the assignment and the assignment was to write a poem. But every sentence had to start with I am from. Um, and so. Um, so I did the assignment, kept it because it was so powerful. And then I shared it with you. And when I shared it with you, you were like, yeah, you should share this. <laughs> Um, and so after my my speech or my talk, um, I shared. I think I think I either shared the poem at the beginning or at the end. But yeah, so I I have it in front of me. Yeah. Yeah, if you could share that, that would be really powerful. And I encourage people who are listening, just like whatever you're doing, just put put it down, 
-hmm. and listen to Renee and let her words kind of uh, just resonate with your mind and with your soul. Okay, um, taking a breath in. <laughs> I am from uh, by Renee Begay. I am from the deep red mesas of the desert. I am from the canvas skies of orange, blue, and red. I am from the smell of clay and juniper after rainstorms. I am from ancient people. I am from the sandhill crane, Golotakwe, and from the eagle, Kakilikwe. I am from the people of artists, creating out of turquoise, stone, silver, and clay. I am from precious, beautiful people. I am from spiritual, prayerful people who are fighting to keep their traditions alive. I am from the smell of sourdough bread fresh from the outdoor adobe oven. I am from laughter and stories around the feasting table. I am from Zuni. I am from a mother who is still hopeful, searching for unfailing love. I am from a father who just couldn't stay but had to see the world. I am from the protection and presence of the one true creator. I am from a painful life rescued by Jesus Christ. I am from the image of God. I am from his thoughts, from his plans. I am from a faithful God whose love never fails. I am from the revealer of mysteries. I am from a God who searches the hearts of all. I am from the desire to be a tree deeply rooted to the living water. And I am from a covenant to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yeah. That's been a while since I read that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Renee, thank you so much yeah, for thank you sharing for that me. with you, with us. What was the response of crew when they heard that poem? Um, I, I didn't see it, but like several of my coworkers and friends told me that there was like a standing ovation. Um, <laughs> and so I, yeah, so I think, I think one of the design team members of the conference said like that's the first time that they've ever seen a standing ovation like with a with a crew person versus like a you know like a famous speaker and stuff so I don't know I don't know if that's true or not but <laughs> well but yeah yeah I, I actually want to share some of this in the comment section so here is uh, the the poem that um, Renee just shared it's on their website Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put that up there. And then here is a link to the, the video. It's on YouTube, um, a, a YouTube channel hosted by Renee and Donnie, her husband, called The Talking Circle. And this is her talk at that crew meeting in 2013. Um, I'm also going to share with you um, uh, two other sites. One is... Uh, the website for Donnie Renee's talking circle. And can you describe what a talking circle is for a moment, Renee? Just let people um, know. It, the talkingcircle.com is a virtual round table. Um, I think like uh, Donnie and I, we were thinking through, like we usually have really good conversations and we were like, it'd be cool to kind of have a website where we can just post our thoughts. And so that's usually what we do. Um, we have a, yeah, we, we usually try to post often, but um, it's kind of like essays that we write and then we just post it on our website and um, kind of hopefully to generate a dialogue about native life, culture, you know, ministry. So, yeah. yeah. So while, thank you so much, Renee. I'm going to put one other link in here. Uh, this is a place both Renee and her husband, Donnie, work for Campus Cruise, our crew. And they work for their nation's ministry, leading uh, this native ministry for the crew organization. And if you like the work they're doing and you want to donate to them or, or um, support them in their work, I just put a link in there where you can donate to the work of Renee and her husband, Donnie. They are doing some invaluable stuff for our native students and for our native peoples and are going about it in a very thoughtful and intentional way. Mm. So, Renee... Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to highlight just a few comments that I saw come in. So uh, Tim said, great dialogue. Thanks. I love the I Am From poem. 
<laughs> we had uh, Shantina who said, this is awesome. Uh, Debbie said, that is a very beautiful poem. Mm, thank you. Um, uh, Leroy Barber was on and said, good stuff. Thanks for sharing. It's so great to thank you, Leroy. <laughs> uh, uh, see Leroy on here. So there's a lot of people. Um, we had Scott who said, yes, we need to re be reminded of this exactly. So yeah, there's so many people who are being even blessed by what you've been able to share here, Renee. I want to mm -hmm. thank everyone for joining us for our second cup of coffee. Did, I didn't even see if you had a cup of coffee, Renee. Did you have one with you? I drink tea. I don't drink coffee, but I have my my native mug. But okay, yeah, but yeah. I want to I want to thank you too. Thank you for just being a really good friend to Donnie and I to always check in with us. And I think the the formation of our faith is has been so careful because of people like you. Um, you checking in with us and having a good friendship and then, you know, people like Uncle Terry uh, LeBlanc and so many others like Richard Twist who has gone before um, to kind of set set that path before us to, to make it a whole lot easier than what, you know, what it was before. So thank you. Thank you for your friendship. You are so welcome, Renee. It <laughs> has been, it is a joy and a blessing to walk alongside both you and Donnie and to be blessed by the journey that you're both on. So uh, I deeply, deeply value your friendship. Um, so if anyone would like to, uh, you know, this is my second cup of coffee. I do this several days a week. If you'd like to um, help support some of this work that I'm trying to do, I'm gonna list my Patreon site there and you can always, um, subscribe to that to help support the work that we're doing. But these are the types of conversations I'm so excited to have. And these are the types of conversations I'm really thrilled uh, to, to invite people into. And I encourage you, if you're, if you're listening or watching to this and you have some thoughts about what Renee um, has said, or you even have questions, uh, feel free to send them to me on, on uh, social media, uh, either comment on the video or send them to me over social media. And if we need to, we might be able to bring Renee back at some point if there's a lot of questions about what she's been able to share or other feedback. But Renee, this has been a great blessing. So a thank, thank you. you so much. All right. Hakona, my relatives. Thanks All for right. joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Walk in beauty. And may we all learn how to walk in beauty together. Hakona. <laughs>